Um, if you want to make a question, please raise your hand, identify yourself, and speak on the, on the mic. Okay, Patrick. Thank you. I think this was a, a wonderful panel. And Patrick, uh, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> My name is Patrick Heller. I'm a sociologist from Brown University, spending the year at the Center for Policy Research in New Delhi. Um, this is a fa fabulous panel, raised all sorts of really interesting comparative questions, and I want to push all of the panelists to uh, think through comparatively some of the implications of the things you've said. And, and I want to point to what strikes me as a quite um, extraordinary conundrum. Comparing these three cases, I mean, if you look at the development discourse, be it the bank or academia, it keeps going back and forth between, you know, there's, there's, there's one of two magical solutions, right? The market or good governance. Uh, and then it's the market and good governance. Yeah. And what's striking in thinking about these three countries is that neither explanation makes any sense <laughs> whatsoever. Uh, in terms of market conforming policy, fiscal management, getting the macroeconomics right, you know, South Africa arguably has been the more market conforming of the three. And we could, we could go back and forth and debate it. I mean, they're at least similar. Uh, and on paper, maybe South Africa has been a little bit more uh, orthodox. In terms of state capacity and good governance, um, any standard measures of state capacity will tell you that South Africa has the most state capacity when it comes to uh, the, the capacity to tax, the, cap the capacity to deliver infrastructure, the degree to which the uh, post-apartheid South African government has closed the service delivery gap in South Africa is extraordinary. Two million houses, almost universal electrification, and you, you pointed out schools, et cetera. Um, and, and it's not surprising. The apartheid state was a high-capacity state. Right? It takes enormous bureaucratic capacity to manage the most systematic system of social exclusion in the world. Right? You have to micromanage where people live where they eat, who they interact with, what jobs they have. And the ANC has one of its great good fortunes, has inherited this apparatus under democratic conditions. So South Africa should be doing the best of the three. I mean, it certainly has more state capacity than India. Um, I think I think Pratap's right. Brazil, by and large, especially in terms of maintaining an intact chain of command from the center down through the municipality, uh, has more state capacity than India. Um, and yet, you know, India is growing the fastest. Brazil's had more success, maybe, in reducing poverty. And South, Af South Africa is the real dilemma. Um, so, if it's not good governance in some stylized sense of the term, if it's not good market-conforming policies in some stylized sense of the term, what's going on here? Right? And and I, I think part of what's going on is the nature of inherited inequality. Uh, you know, these are three extraordinarily unequal societies. But in Brazil, there's been a frontal assault on inequality for now 20, 30 years. In discourse and policy, in the evidence, beginning with liberation theology, all the way through the, the sort of political consensus around the need to tackle uh, the problems of social exclusion. In, in India, it's been less, as Pratap suggested, politically articulated, but it's there. The second democratic upsurge the rise of lower caste groups through politics, through new rights-based discourse. And in South Africa, it's, it's there officially, um, but it, it's not clear that there's been a political project to carry through on uh, the promise of social justice and inclusion. And I, I can't but help think that the, the legacy of apartheid is just much deeper and much more difficult to surmount in South Africa than the legacies of inequality in Brazil. And I'd, I'd be curious what Let's collect other two questions. <coughs> Does anyone want to? Well, I, let me add in this in the same this same path dependence perspective uh, that you two, Patrick. Let me ask also again. It's a question for Anne. Then we we generalize this. You, we're pushing you against the wall, uh, which is. Um, I think we, sh we should not forget uh, the ideological matrix of the ANC. Uh, the ANC was uh, most of its uh, leaders, I mean, uh, to, to its credit, was 
they have done a formidable and heroic uh, uh, thing in, in fighting against uh, the apartheid. But let's not forget that they were, uh, ideologically speaking, they were shaped by a Moscow type of state-centered social, most of them. Yeah, let me, you correct me if I'm wrong. In um, how much of this sort of reluctance or antagonist uh, proclivity <coughs> uh, against the private sector can be credited to this uh, ideological origin of the party? Because I think it still plays an important role in, in, in shaping the policy agenda in, in South Africa. So why don't you take these two questions and then we sort of... Okay, I'm going to try and wrestle with these two important issues and then perhaps other South Africans want to come in. I think Patrick's raised a very good question. Um, let me give you my answer to this. And the one is that South African state capacity at the turn of when we became democratic had many strengths. It had some real weaknesses as well. It's one thing to be a control bureaucrat or to deal with services and other things for a part of the population and not very well for everyone else, to worse to become a developmental kind of bureaucracy. So there was that objective challenge. I think that where you've got to deal with a much bigger society, okay, you know, in a service way. The second is that, so the challenge was big, and I think that most people in government and outside did not <coughs> grapple with how much damage apartheid had done to people, to the country, to rural areas, urban areas, and so on. So there wasn't a sort of concerted, this is how we're going to deal with the rural sector, for example, where well over a third of the population live and more people have an interest and so on. However, we don't have the kind of state capacity that you're talking about now and haven't had for the last five years. Our state has been considerably weakened it's uneven. And there are many South Africans who exaggerate this now, and I kind of want to say there's no need to exaggerate how bad things are. But it's an uneven state, which is at national level very weak in some important parts, not in our treasury. Um, and at other levels is uneven, but weaker. <laughs> so we have managed in the last period through a process of appointing jobs for PALS, much too rapid affirmative action into the civil service where people are ruined. They're put in positions they're not qualified to do and then they can't do it. And then you get, they then appoint a whole lot of people so you get the cycle going down. To the point where there's some departments, um, Mike Spicer will remember about five years ago, we came to a point where I went to my board and said I refuse to deal with the particular department ever again. They're incompetent. And they were announced as incompetent some two years later. So there's real less capacity than you, you, than you think. That's the first thing. And then on the other side of the, po the, the, the point, <laughs> we've been much less market oriented than perhaps some people have interpreted us to be. Yes, we have stuck with fiscal discipline up till now, and the ANC, in many businessmen will tell you that we've had the best finance minister in Trevor Manuel, for example, and then pretty solid in the next his successor that the country's had in decades. So fiscal management being solid, but other aspects, I mean, I would put it this way, Mandela and Mbeki came back from Davos and other engagements persuaded that very reluctantly they had to accept the market. They did not go to the ANC or the mayor of some small town and explain why they were convinced. So it's not as though there was a wholesale, this is how we're going to go now, we have to go with a market-oriented approach for the following good reasons. No. 
So there is considerable ambiguity and it's, we have introduced legislation that is a step back from market-oriented approaches and attitude of very, very increasingly so under President Zuma have many people's attitudes have become anti-market. So we announce a massive infrastructure program. Everybody supports this, the right thing to do in a sort of recession, all, all good reasons. But the government says we're going to do this on our own private sector, a minuscule role. Surprise, surprise, nothing's happened. So how you characterize South Africa is not the reality that I see, and that in part explains why we haven't made progress. So it's a mix of a lot of things. Sergio's point is that is the one I'm making, that we inherited an anti-private sector attitude, coupled with a, comp a real lack of understanding about what it means to run a business. And coupled with a black-white thing, which was <coughs> successful white people are generally successful because they exploited black people. Not that they worked hard, took risks, did all sorts of things, etc., etc. All the wrong ideas in people's heads on which to build an entrepreneurial kind of high growth economy. So I think there's a real explanation for all of that um, that, that has got worse, not better. Can you help me? Roberto Palais do Rio Branco, eu sou empresário e presido a Câmara de Comércio do Brasil e Diário. Eu sou presidente da Chamber of Commerce Brasileira e não sou a minha empresa, eu sou o meu lado. Despite the work for government twice, because I believe I have to be also sitting on the side of the table. But, uh, first of all, uh, just for this discussion of Brazil, for my professional reasons, I was a long time involved in mainly industry, but also I was a pioneer in this uh, new frontiers of this country. So for both reasons, I had to go and travel a lot to this country. So one question that many Pratap have mentioned is, uh, I always believe so important the uh, media influence in any country. And in our country, I believe, uh, that was for one side very good. We were at the time one of the big advertisers in our home appliances company. But on the other side, even we went to the government more than many times, exactly that for instance. We were opening at the time new frontiers. But they were selling that you should not be in the agricultural activity at the time. The good was to be in the urban uh, site. India is 68% of the population is still 68 or nowhere like that, but still is in the, in the countryside, is agriculture. Uh, I understand there is some plan. What has been happening in India in the last uh, 18 years or 20 years is supposed to be a plan, uh, a successful plan. Secondly, that you have also a plan for urbanization. My question is really uh, what happened uh, during all this period. Because in Brazil, I believe, uh, first of all, the wireless group, coming mainly to uh, when the developed emerging middle class grows, what happens, uh, how we can move ahead. So my question is, uh, South Africa, for different reasons, also you had violence for many years, and still we have. In Brazil, this violence has been growing, and uh, I'm convinced that for many reasons, media, uh, TV, mainly for many years now, all the media systems, uh, internet, whatever, sells to any person in this country, and in Brazil, mainly than more than in India, perhaps in South Africa, any poor person would have and had a TV set. So what we were selling at the time, that they should have uh, been the consumption market, let's say. So for any means, they should have it. So I, this helped a lot to grow violence. <coughs> So I don't know if this helps also in South Africa to, to make this happen. We always believed also in this emerging middle class, and, and we had uh, Fernando Henrique Cardoso, he was really the man that made uh, the social problem become a reality in this country, and his wife, a wonderful person, Kuti Cardoso, made it happen in a good way. 
that I believe PT saw that was a great opportunity to, to get votes, not because they were so <laughs> concerned about the social side, but they, uh, at the same time, uh, shot two good targets. Uh, and apparently the world also was in a very good moment in the economy. So this made uh, good to Brazil, uh, there's big growth in the emerging cl middle classes, and also we believed that growing these middle classes, violence should uh, also diminish in, in our country. But on the contrary, I believe it's growing. So my question is uh, mainly regarding India, but also South Africa. We uh, were responsible for the IPSA. We were attending all the IPSA meetings, uh, making the CO formula existing, and the CO formula that doesn't work too much as it has well as the CO formula that is in Brazil. But well, my main question is that, in, in mainly regarding India, is that uh, I always put this question. I want to hear from you about your opinion, also all of you, if you want. So, the, the, the question, please, the, 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 yeah, okay. the, the question is that uh, this population, so big in the countryside, as much as they get uh, communications, what will happen in this uh, behavior of consuming, being a consumer? You have 350 billion people, already a big market, but still a bigger market that will come as a consumer. What would be the harm or the good side of this growth in, in media in India? And secondly, also one thing that in, in all over the world, but maybe India also, but are very concerned S is... Sorry, please. Just now you have I'll, to close because I'll, other I'll people finish. want to, to is close. That how uh, will be a, can be a problem, the growth, of this uh, Muslim population in India that can be, uh, be a, a kind of conflict. I'm seeing all these things because in India you don't have sex and violence at all. Thank you. Thank you. Should I ask now? Yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> no, if, if they were going to answer it first. No, no, no. I think, um, well, Paneos has made it, let's say, a, a, a kind of question that invite let's say, uh, another lecture, but you can make your question now. Okay. Uh, my name is Charles Poots. I run a finance and strategy boutique, uh, Vedena Ventures. I work mostly for for-profit companies. I'm also on the board of a few for-profit companies. I don't have uh, any direct involvement with government. Um, and the reason I say this is because in what we call uh, real world, Usually we say that uh, to get a turnaround, to have a major change in a company, you need one type of executive, you need one type of person. Whereas to later on continue running the company, you usually require a different type of person with a different profile. From what Anne was uh, speaking about South Africa, I was wondering if perhaps uh, some similar kind of thought for uh, government in South Africa would apply and at the first moment after apartheid, they needed one type of leadership, and perhaps today they need a different type of leadership. And the follow-on still on this is, when I think about um, India, a term often comes to my mind, which is dysfunctional democracy. Um, I think about that sometimes in other countries too, but um, from, from what I learned from politics in India, uh, that. The, uh, term comes to my mind, and from what I was hearing now uh, from Anne, uh, perhaps the same could apply to South Africa too. I'd like to hear some comments. On. Thank you. So, back to you. You, you. No, no. I think it's enough for this this room. Who's? Okay. You can start. Um, <coughs> large questions. Uh, to be honest, I mean, I mean, the question about violence is is a really important and a very complicated one. I mean, I, I mean, I'm not sure I have anything particularly intelligent to say on this, but 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 it is it is. I mean, in some senses, I think uh, if you look at the social science literature, I, you know, I think it'd be hard to sort of come up with I think a convincing story around. Uh, a couple of thoughts on that. I mean, just uh, and, and and this is an interesting. I, I think it is a question being asked in India at the moment, which is you know, as the kind of urbanization story proceeds forward, 
is it going to have, amongst other things, this particular characteristic of sort of urban spaces becoming more violent in, in different kinds of ways? Um, I think a lot, I mean, I mean, that's where I think politics was meant, which is my own sense is for what it's worth, and it's a platitude, but um, is I think for that not to happen, there will have to be a sense that the urban spaces belong to everybody. Uh, and I think one of the reasons Indian cities up till now have escaped that, I mean, to a certain degree, is because the poor could show up. I mean, it made, you know, from some conceptions, it made for messy cities, it made for, you know, sort of bad infrastructure, all of that. Um, on the other hand, these were everybody's cities. Uh, the spatial segregations of slums and privileged areas was much less. And you have to imagine that at some level, I think that claim that the poor had, look, you know, we may not be rich, we may not have services, nothing, but, you know, this is a space we belong. As opposed to the process of urbanization where urbanization becomes a contest over. You guys out, we guys in. Uh, my own sense is I think that's going to be the the important sort of um, variable, uh, and it has all kinds of. I mean, there's a there's a there's a there's an urban per person in Delhi, Professor Dinesh Mohan, who keeps you know saying that actually where you locate the poor physically in a space has huge impact on violence. And for example, uh, he has a hypothesis about travel commute times for the poor in a city as a sort of reasonable predictor uh, because it you know, it breaks our family structures, all of those other things. But I agree with you. I mean, I think one of the things which we don't have a way of capturing in our planning processes, uh, in the way we think about development, is these very finely textured sinews that actually make for social order. And one of the dangers of the way we think about urbanization in a planning mode is this kind of, okay, it's about putting a lot of buildings, it's about putting a lot of uh, you know, infrastructure, metro, and, and somehow something will happen. It, it, it's, it's in, in a sense a lot more than that. Uh, your question about Muslims, um, I mean, it, it, again, I think the important point of, I mean, you know, we can have a complicated argument about, uh, 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 in a sense, how they place in Indian democracy. But I think the most important and fundamental point, I think, is so long as the Muslim community had a sense, and has a sense, continuing sense, I mean, there are issues around discrimination, very significant ones. Uh, uh, in some senses, it is becoming the more marginalized community uh, uh, in India. I mean, for a whole lot of variety of historical reasons, I mean, the Muslim elites, particularly in North India, migrated to Pakistan, I mean, there's a whole range of things we can talk about. But again, the most important thing is a continued sense that there is a place for them in the political process. One of the reasons why, you know, despite, you know, the rise of Hindu nationalism in some form, despite the discourse of global terrorism, none of the apocalyptic predictions about Hindu-Muslim relations, which everybody was kind of, you know, all the social science literature was going on about in the 90s and have, have come true, is because democracy has a capacity to moderate that radicalism. Uh, for good or for ill, uh, I mean, I think there is a problem about Muslim representation, about a political narrative, uh, as it were, which I think other marginalized groups have, like Dalits and so forth. But it is still a politics where, you know, they think of five chief ministers as their leaders. Right? Uh, so I think the process of democratic incorporation is a very critical variable in diffusing violence. I mean, I mean that, that is in fact the, the kind of the logic of Demar, right? So insofar as those structures are deeper, pluralistic, and incorporative, I, I don't think it's one thing we worry about. I mean, and, and you know, I think one, if you just want to take an anecdotal thing, despite Gujarat 2002, last 10 years where there have been incredible pressures where most people predicted you would actually have increasingly polarized in the Muslim conflict, have actually in statistical terms actually been the years of least uh, so there are some normative frames bringing the fact that courts are, you know, in their own ham-handed, delayed way, it's taken 10 years, but people are being booked for communal riots, uh, um, is an incredible normative shift compared to India's own, own history. 
So, so long as your institutions have some place where they send a signal that there are certain things you can't do to people and they can own that process. I, I, I don't worry about the violent stuff. I mean, I think there, there'll always be a 2% loony fringe, but the point is not them. The point is how the mainstream processes uh, respond. If you respond on the question about South Africa as a dysfunctional democracy, um, in some respects, South Africa is a very strong democracy. We, as I said, we have a strong civil society. I can say anything I want. We have a very free press. We have an independent judiciary. We have regular elections. So one has to be very careful how one thinks about this. On the other hand, we have not yet had an alteration of power. Um, now you could say we're a young democracy, so give it time. Um, and that's true. So we haven't had an alteration of power, which is a big test. Um, it's one issue. And the other is, as I said, I think that in some respects people vote history rather than their future interests. And that, that does affect how this democracy is working. Um, but in very many respects, we are a loud, noisy, vibrant, discordant democracy. So that would not be top of my list of what's wrong with South Africa at all. Uh, there was someone left in the first round. OK, you two. Okay. Hi, my name is Natalia Fingerman. I am a coordinator of the International Relations Program at Sanak University. And I'm also a PhD student at FGV. Uh, I've got actually two questions. The first question would be, for Mr. Bratava Meta, <laughs> sorry if I cannot sorry. pronounce. <laughs> so uh, you were talking about social policy in Brazil and uh, experimental social policy. How would you define uh, this experimental social policy? And in your opinion, that would be a problem. Uh, we having experimental social policy. So that's the first question. And the second question, I think it would be for, uh, I don't know if everyone can answer, but it would be for the three countries. Um, we've seen the India, Brazil, and South Africa forum in 2003, and uh, a lot of people were very excited about it. And uh, how would you evaluate this forum? And uh, do you think it could help to promote development? So that would be my question, thank you. I think you should, you should start right there. Any, anyone else? Yes. Oh, sorry. <coughs> All right, and then Mariana on the, on the far left, extreme left. Bom dia. Uh, my name is Marcelo Fortada. I'm the executive director of Greenpeace in Brazil. Uh, I have a question about leadership. Um, you mentioned a lot about leadership on the national context. But these are three countries that are playing a very important role on leadership on the international forum. However, most of the times when uh, these countries attend international forums, uh, the leadership is much more talking about national issues, carrying the national uh, agenda, and not necessarily addressing the international agenda. So my question is, given that we're talking about forums, be it climate change or the economic crisis in 2008 when the G20 uh, was portrayed by these three countries as a very important uh, opportunity. The question is, what kind of leadership should we expect from these three countries at the international forum responding to this uh, emerging trends you discussed here today? Okay, last, last question, uh, Mariana. Hello, uh, good morning, I'm so, uh, Mediana with Embraer, and uh, first time you congratulate Sergio and Nelson uh, FHC for organizing such an interesting debate. And unfortunately, I wasn't able to be here yesterday, so I am uh, very much look forward to hearing some of the results of that discussion and conclusions in the sense of 
uh, what were the highlights for each of the countries in terms of listening to the experiences of one another? So uh, what would you, given and taking into consideration that you've already said here that we, that you can, we are, we all consider your, uh, yourselves democracies, and so let's take the other two points and look at development and uh, these emerging middle classes. What, what struck you the most during the debate yesterday? What could uh, you take, what kind of lessons could you take from uh, the other two countries? I know it's a very general question, but it, since I wasn't here today, I, I, I would like to hear some of that. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, <laughs> you're smart, my friend. You have all, each and every one of you will have to answer Mariana's question. <laughs> Please, you can, can you start? Um, so, you're right. I mean, the word experimental was used a bit loosely, and it's not used in any really sort of technical sense. But, 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 but I, in a sense, I think, uh, in a sense, let's say the willingness to well, two things. I mean, one is the kind of willingness to put together a program that you think emerges out of an organic understanding what the intervention should be, rather than a kind of first principles textbook uh, case. And experimentalism, I think, in the sense of sort of uh, trusting some degree of local government involvement in kind of implementing uh, it. So sort of, you know, I mean, and one of the things I think Brazil does better than India, much better is this, for example, targeting story. And part of the targeting story, I think, is part of this kind of trusting sort of local government. So, you know, even if two get it wrong, others will get it. Uh, get it right. Mm -hmm. There isn't that assumption that it can, in a sense, kind of all be controlled uh, uh, from the top, and, and then sort of building, you know, all kinds of interesting coalitions to, to sort of supervise it. So, so it's, it's, it's in that very loose sense. Um, the, the IPSA and the international leadership uh, question. Uh, the IPSA one is interesting. I mean, it, look, at a very basic level, I think what it has done, uh, which may or may not yield any results is, is I think it does it has increased interest in at least in India about Brazil and South Africa and, and we were talking I mean South Africa perhaps a little uh, less but in the case of Brazil we had basically a zero knowledge base if perhaps a negative knowledge base almost uh, so the fact that you know you recognize that there is uh, there are other important developing um, emerging democracies uh, and they face some common challenges in negotiating the international system. Uh, I think at the level of, I think, broadening the set of options and coalitions that's been, but, but you're right, I mean, it, you know, it doesn't have a strategic unity. It's in the pecking order of sort of, you know, BRICS, G20, the various acronyms, not that high. But we are at that moment in world politics where, you know, lots of things are being tried out by ways of um, uh, uh, associate, which, you know, which something might give you bargaining power in different so I think in terms of getting some pre-consultative processes going that then feed into other processes, it, it, it does have my sense of value. The international leadership question is a, is a hard one. Um, one, I think it is fair to say, I mean, I think we have been in this phase, particularly the last two or three years, where almost every single government in the world has been so domestically preoccupied, its domestic authority so tenuous, uh, that it's hard for them to sort of even take the minimal risk of the international system. It's true of the United States, it's true of China, it's true of Europe, it's true of Russia. So not only do we have a kind of G0 world, nobody in charge, you, you also don't have governments who have domestically the legitimacy to be able to, in fact, Brazil and Turkey were the only two sort of that seemingly, you know, were trying to kind of project themselves in a different way. But the second thing I would say about the international story um, is, uh, look, let's face it. I mean, one, I think we have to admit that for a bunch of problems, particularly climate change, uh, there isn't yet any country that is thinking out of the framework of its national interest. Mm -hmm. And we know the structure of that problem is such that if you think in that frame, you don't have a solution. Uh, honestly. I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. In fact, if anything, the whole shale gas story in the US uh, may be good for reducing carbon emissions in the US for getting a global agreement. It's completely a disaster. 
because in a sense the US negotiation is now we are going to reduce it anyway so we don't need to do anything. Uh, developing countries will sort of continue to argue for that card, you know, speed. So in that sense, I mean, climate change, I'm, I'm, to be honest, really pessimistic in terms of actually creating a kind of global framework. I do think what might happen, which I think is the more interesting thing, is that interestingly, the national action plans of each country are actually much more in advance of what their positions in the international negotiating model are. Uh, I'm usually skeptical of a lot of what the Indian government does. But actually, on the National Action Plan for Climate Change, there is a lot of action happening, not just on renewables, the solar and all of that, but you know, energy intensity targets, all of that. So the question is whether, not so much whether there's a global agreement, but whether all of that stuff is being embedded at the national levels in ways in which adds up to some kind of cumulative thing and adds up fast enough. Um, that's still an open open question, particularly in the uh, on, you know in a sense of the climate. Change. But on the leadership question, I, I'll just say one more thing. You know, in the West, there is this now this construction. Uh, India, Brazil, China are growing. They should be more responsible powers. What is often meant by being a responsible power is you should agree with us. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and that construction, I should be. I mean, it, it's it's actually, in fact, you could say that. If these three countries do well by themselves and their people, they will actually do contribute more to being responsible by the power of their example than by any ambition to kind of prematurely run the global system. I think take your question, but maybe come <laughs> <laughs> Bolivar will wrap everything up. Uh, okay. <laughs> That's my best friend. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll be very brief on the IPSA question. Um, I'll agree with everything that Pratap said. I think he's right. Um, he's got the issue on the agenda in some mild way, but this has not been the most successful forum. There's also been a business equivalent with IPSA, which from all that I know has not been very productive either. Uh, there's some academic sort of equivalents, also not being very productive. I don't know if Mike Spicer, who's probably represented business in some of us from South Africa, wants to add anything to that. But, so I agree with Pratap, it sounds just right for South Africa as well. In terms of leadership in international fora, South Africa has historically liked to punch way above its weight in the international <laughs> fora. We have grand ambitions. We would very much like to be a member of the Security Council, and that has influenced many dimensions of our foreign policy for quite a while, um, particularly our Africa policy and when we do or don't speak out about what's happening in Africa because we want African votes to get a seat on the Security Council. Why we want the seat on the Security Council <laughs> so much is frankly beyond me. But, and when we were there on one of the temporary seats, we didn't cover ourselves with great glory. And so, but this is a key driver of the country's foreign policy. But Pratap's right in two ways. The, if you don't have a lot of authority at home, which is increasingly the, the, the case for our political leaders, what you say in international fora has less weight. Um, South Africa has also been a bit unpredictable on which way it's voting on particular issues and seems to want to contradict itself when it gets home sometimes. So because the country's political leadership is not all that clear cut about where they're taking the country, this is reflected in foreign policy. Um, and then our Africa policy is very much determined by our desire to get a Security Council seat. We also seem to be going through a phase where we want to do anything China wants us to do. And this is, I don't know how long that will last. Um, I agree with Pratap. The most important contribution South Africa could make globally is to be a great success. And to do it in our own way and to do it over a sustained period, and that would be the most profound contribution. And where I would argue we should be putting our energies, um, a minority position in the country. Mm -hmm. uh, so let me stop there. So, Bolivar. 
you are in charge. I'm in charge. <laughs> Let me first uh, uh, make a comment, uh, uh, if I may, on, on the crime issue. See, I, I was struck by your observation that uh, with the growth of the middle class, which means by Brazil getting less and equal in richer over the next two, three decades, uh, crime should go down. Um, I think we should be extremely careful with that, with that projection. See, I, I think we, we, we don't know. The issue is we don't know. Uh, if you look at the, at, the, at the literature and research, I think you could you would find a, a ground to support a far different hypothesis. You know? One, nice, it would go down. You see? The second, uh, not so nice. It would first go up, you see, because of, you know, we are a totally urban country, economic development creates, you know, tensions. So it would go up. And it would go down when we have nice government, you know, nice judiciary, and people are really happy about their level of well-being. But, but for some time, it would go up. Uh, it could stay as it is, so it would be just straight, you know. Uh, for how long? You know, if it is a straight line like this, it would be bad enough. Because <laughs> crime rate is awful right now. And it would go up, why not? You see, uh, uh, we have narco-traffic, we have a, a, a learning of crime, in the peripheries, you know, you have adolescents who became convinced that they have nothing to gain by studying and and following a bureaucratic career. So it's much more interesting and adventurous to get a, a, a 38 and, and go out, you know, uh, to a tourist club. But we really don't know. You see, the hypothesis. So I think we should not do what we did 40 years ago, which was not to think about it. See, 40 years ago, we thought Brazil, uh, God is Brazil, you know, <laughs> nothing like that's going to take place. I, I think we should be aware. Uh, I think God is Brazil, but uh, <laughs> we should be. <laughs> 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 Pistol is old school. They like the 845. <laughs> now, that is, is the high tech. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm talking about adolescents. Yeah. Now, uh, with regard to the competitive issues, I'm going to leave the international part aside because it, uh, it would be too long. But concerning the, the comparative uh, points, you see, I, I'm uh, new to this project. I, it strikes me that there are many, many similarities. Uh, despite the huge difference, there are many, many similarities uh, among our countries. Uh, when it comes to diff differences in the sociological and political aspects, uh, I think we, would, we should make a, 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 you know, a, a sustained effort to, to really try to understand the countries better. And uh, one difficulty, of course, is that I'm sure that in South Africa and India you have different interpretations of your own country as we do in Brazil. So, so it, it, it's a hard one. I have one interpretation in Brazil which most sociologists and political scientists would call conservative, you see? But I think there are some basic statements, uh, and I'll be very brief on this, uh, without which you can't really understand this. Uh, the first one is this. Uh, the, the cleavages, the lines of conflict, are economic, you see? You can talk about uh, race, Indian, whatever. Uh, those are important problems from the human rights point of view, but uh, an educational point of view, but, but politically speaking, the, the cleavages are economic. Even the regional cleavages are economic. Mm -hmm. You know, central, uh, uh, central government versus uh, local governments are disputes over the budget. So they are economic. You see, it, it's, that's one big advantage that Brazil has. You see, it's the, Although we don't like people from Rio. Oh, no, for no, we example. Don't, no, no. Yeah, neither for me nor that right? <laughs> and, that's why, and that, of course, is why we discriminate against them on the bunch. <laughs> but in any case, that, that's the first thing. Uh, one uh, uh, you know, consequence or one step further uh, beyond this statement is uh, Brazil, unlike South Africa and India, has one homogeneous language. You see, uh, that makes a huge difference. For good and worse, you see, 
I think that is crucial uh, uh, to explain the immense impact that television has on, on Brazil. Uh, that is good, that's bad, it depends. But in any case, it is one homogeneous thing. But there are very few tiny uh, you know, differences in accent, small groups that tries to, to conserve uh, different aspects, but basically it's one language. And it's Portuguese and Peter. Uh, uh, very poorly spoken, by the way. <laughs> now, the other thing, and here uh, is where I think most people would call me conservative and, and, uh, and you, can, you can go ahead. And be very, uh, Sergio, for example, <laughs> he's Extreme a well-known left, well -known left just in <laughs> <laughs> But the level of political violence Political violence in Brazil has been extremely low uh, uh, by international standards, ever, forever, you see. Because of the kind of government we had, the kind of Portuguese, said, well, whatever explanation you like. You see, it has always been very, very, very low. Uh, the last time you had, you know, uh, parts, uh, you know, people in uniform fighting one another was in 1932. For Three weeks with, you know, a handful, and because of, obviously. A handful of, of, of people died. And just that. Then when you come to the military government, which of course was oppressive so. and in many ways tyrannical, but the reasonably uh, uh, accepted figure for people who died or, or disappeared is between 500 and 600. That compares to 20,000 in Chile, which, which is a much smaller country. <coughs> I think this must be, be, be taken into account. So it was not very difficult to bring people who previously were almost going into armed struggle, into the political fold. Uh, by the way, one of those, uh, one of the PT uh, leaders who was involved in, in the armed struggle became uh, uh, second in the, in, in the Ministry of Defense. Oh, yes, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Uh, That's amazing. And the yeah, pre yeah. President Dilma was a member Dilma was of a guerrilla. Guerrilla. So, yeah, I think uh, the, your, your point, uh, uh, and which I think was it's interesting about this, this convergence that you see in Brazil, uh, it's not complete, but I think you have a point. And, and the explanation, I think, is you know, that our political uh, virus has been extremely long. Uh, we have, you know, had a, a constitutional government of sorts for a long time. So you can't bring people into the fold again without a, a tremendous problem within the country. So uh, just to complete, you see, after the observation of viruses, uh, Brazilians don't like to recognize things. They, they, they like to think that the country is awful. So it, it's really bad, you know? awful history. And, and with the PT in power, we have a process of historicide. You know? They are killing history and creating a new history. <laughs> <laughs> but, the, but the fact is, you see, the fact is that Brazil has had continuous political institutions for almost 200 years. You see, the number of years in which the, the legislature was closed down is 14 out of almost 200 years. So I think uh, it was like in 1824 that we started a constitution, uh, uh, you know, a good one by, by, uh, you know, f f uh, by the standards of, uh, of the epoch. The judiciary was opened up in, in 1826 and so did uh, uh, the legislature. So it's a continuous history. Was it oligarchic? I don't care. You see, the whole world was. So the, the, the history of democracy is, is one of slow expansion of the political arena that applies to any country that you want. So if you look at it this way, you will, you will understand that Brazil has essentially a, a history of doing things through politics much more than through force. That's the point. Now, uh, the, where the, the issue becomes difficult is this. Uh, uh, between roughly 1960 and 1985, we had the combined uh, impact of a, of a military government, uh, of fast population growth, and fast urbanization. See? Uh, we could have the best state capacity in the world, and still we would have a very miserable uh, uh, you know, periphery with awful 
services and so on because the impact was just that. We are, as you observe, over 85 percent. But in a very short period of time, you see, we had that tremendous impact. When that uh, military uh, uh, regime was over and these processes began to flatten out, then had one whole generation of economic stagnation, extremely low growth. Well, I, I think that was the wrong way to explain all kinds of things. And then, uh, you see, what, what I think what I would uh, uh, propose as, as a point of comparison, I'm sure there are many parallels in India and South Africa, is that is that the, the political system, which has all kinds of flaws, but it has been flexible enough to absorb the immense tensions of us in <coughs> these impacts I just mentioned over the last uh, 30 years. Thank you. I, I subscribe to your views. <laughs> you do, by the way. No, no. You're getting reaction. <laughs> <laughs> As time goes by. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so why don't you comment on what has just been said by Bolivar, Bolivar and then we close. No, uh, it actually sounds quite convincing. I mean, which is, you know, I mean, I think the fundamental thing, which is an institutional framework, which has the ability to flexibly accommodate challenges, uh, sometimes not in the neatest way, but uh, and and in a sense, con and a consensus around sort of maintaining that frame, where there are certain boundaries you don't cross, at least if you cross them, don't cross them for too long. Uh, um, I think, I, I mean, I, I think that's exactly right. And in that sense, I mean, I, I'm thinking of the kind of similarity, which is, it, it is again a sort of, it's an ameliorative enterprise. Uh, uh, in that sense, sort of, you know, and, 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 and with, with all its advantages and disadvantages. I mean, sometimes it can go a bit too slow for, for some people's life. But, uh, so, so I think, I mean, I think an, an important methodological point, which it, which I am at least sympathetic to, which is in a sense, there is a kind of path dependence to that institutional legacy, uh, and which manifests itself in, in, in a sense, these subtle ways, which is your first instinct in a political culture to say, you know what, we'll figure it out, you'll take one, we'll take three, something like that, as opposed to, and, and, and I think, it, and, and I think it's, it's it, but, 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 but the counter to that in, in some ways, I mean, which I think is the interest, which is, whether you would subscribe to the view that, uh, and maybe this is a question about the character of Brazilian nationalism, perhaps more than anything else, because that's the one fissure that produces a conflict as well. Partly Brazil has had a, at least compared to India, a propitious external environment, yeah. neighborhood, let us say. Yeah, we have never uh, faced the existential but, 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 but And it has a, a common language, but the fundamental fact that the nation is constituted through politics, mm -hmm. right? Uh, that's, in a sense, the very, the very sort of central thing. So who gets included, who gets excluded, is always a matter to be mediated through politics. Mm -hmm. It's not a matter with a kind of pre-given, in a sense, answer. And in that sense, I think the parallel with India, where, you know, some is, 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 is the idea of India is essentially a political idea. I mean, you know, in, 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 in some, uh, some ways, um, uh, I think is 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 you know it's important. So it's you know really powerful uh, way. And, and 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 the question is in a sense I think whether the middle class continues that traditional messy yeah, accommodation. That's, that's, that's the question. Good. Good. In return. Well, I'll be. No, press the button. I'll be very brief. I think um, in response to your very interesting points. South Africa, in many respects, is a nation in the making. And the big disjuncture in 1994, when we became a democracy, has meant a recreation of institutions and <coughs> thinking about who we are as South Africans. And this is incomplete. Um, and one of the questions is going to be, do we, how do we play this out as a what kind of country uh, do we become, and are we all full South Africans in a, in a new sense of the term? 
because in some respects, you know, you have to say, can we have white leadership in South Africa today? So there are a whole range of questions about the, the nature of this, this society, its vision of itself and where it's going that, that make us rather different from Brazil. Uh, we are a country of 11 languages, 11 official languages, which was rather clever because then, well, I don't know enough about India, but it means that English is the official language in almost every respect with some show of you know, some deference to the other languages which in some respects makes it harder for them. On the other hand, you, there is a tendency from my side to say, well, there needs to be sufficient civil society support to keep those languages alive. Um, and so that's, but so we are a, a country in the making and we're, we're in this tricky period now. Yeah, thank you so much, the three of you in um grande abraço para vocês, obrigado pela presença e pela participação. Obrigado.